Okay, so I hope everyone can see my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Oh, okay. Yes, you can see your screen. Okay, so today we will be discussing about uh, this week challenge uh, from the morning tutorial. Ebebel introduced that this week we will be doing with a hypothesis testing and mainly we will be doing a, an AB, AB type of uh, hypothesis testing. So there are different ways of testing hypotheses. We have the classical AB testing, we have the sequential the sequential a b testing sorry about that and uh of late now we have the machine learning models method so today i'll take you through the classical a b testing method then uh tomorrow we'll go through the other two sequential and uh, machine learning models so first to engage you guys uh does uh, anyone know about hypothesis testing what is an hypothesis can I hear from the crowd anyone who has done A-B testing before maybe to explain to us what is a hypothesis testing? Show of hands. Yes, Martin. Yes, Martin. Just go ahead. I don't know whether you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you now. All right, uh, so it's where somebody presents an argument and then uh, you test whether that argument is true and uh, base it uh, and, and uh, back it up with evidence that is from the statistical tests. So somebody okay, brings uh, an argument is what is the argument is called the hypothesis and then uh there are two the, it can be a null or it can be an alternative so the null is where it uh it goes according to the uh the the, the common the, the common way of maybe thinking and then the argument is now what challenges that common way of thinking and when you present evidence to challenge the common way you can be able to uh, succeed to uh, nullify the hypothesis. Yeah, so that's it from my side. Okay, thank you, Martin. That is the next definition of a hypothesis testing. Anyone who wants to get specific on uh, why we have the A, B hypothesis testing? Anyone with an idea? Okay, so no one is raising their hand. I'll just continue and introduce um, introduce hypothesis testing as well as uh, A-B testing. I hope you can see my screen. We'll briefly go through what is hypothesis testing just uh, to explain it. Uh, also through A-B testing and then maybe a few steps in uh, conducting A-B testing because that's what will be required from for this week. <laughs> So as Martin has said, a hypothesis is just like that argument that somebody raised, something that is uh, from the word. And then um, when we do now the test of this hypothesis, we are trying to prove that this uh, fact is, uh, or this phenomena, whether it actually aligns with with uh, what the insight that we had. So just like um, Martin has also mentioned, there are different forms of uh, hypothesis testing, but uh, for this, specific uh, tutorial, I'll just mention two types. You can go and Google other types. We'll go through the null hypothesis and our uh, alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is uh, basically states that there's no difference. It tends to be a little bit negative 
while the alternative uh, hypothesis is uh, is positive. So like, uh, I just want to ask you guys, knowing what a hypothesis is and uh, knowing that a null hypothesis is negative, can anyone, if you have already done or maybe you're planning to do, can anyone tell me the null hypothesis for this week? Yes, Martin again. Uh, whether the change in the smart art design made for the exposed group will result to no change in the conversion rate. Okay, so I like how you are saying it. It's uh, whether it will result in no change. But I think the main, yeah, as Faith is saying, uh, the way we'll put this null hypothesis is that there is no change in the conversion rate between the control group and uh, the exposed group. So anyone who wants to give it a try on the alternative hypothesis for this week? Anyone from the crowd, can I just start calling them? I need uh, someone to give a try on the alternative hypothesis for the week. Notice that the alternative hypothesis is uh, optimistic and uh, whatever we say about null that there is no, then alternative will just try to say that there is. So I just need it uh, more defined for this week so that we are all in the same page. Any volunteers? Okay, guys, so, ah, nice. Ken, Ken Okora, go ahead, give us the alternative hypothesis for this week. Mm. Smart ads results to increased, no, maybe image growth. The brand, improved brand image, yeah. Okay, thank you, Ken. That is a little bit more general, uh, but uh, if you want to get more specific, you'll notice that, uh, okay, do you know the brand? Okay, sure, yeah, that, that is actually nice. We, we just want to say that uh, our hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis is that um, there will actually be a change in the results between uh, the ones who are, shown, who are shown the ad and the ones who are not shown. Okay, so I'll go through a B. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So in a hypothesis testing, just uh, something I wanted to touch on is there are, uh, there are mainly two types of errors in hypothesis testing. We have the type 1 error and other type 2 error. So a type 1 error is when we reject the null hypothesis when it is true. We have just said that the null hypothesis says that there is no change. So if in the end we actually reject this hypothesis and say that there is an error, that uh, that one we call a uh, false. Let me see. A false negative. I think I think type one error is a false negative. So when we reject this null hypothesis, yet uh, it is actually true, then uh, we will be having a type one error. And uh, then the, the the opposite is now true for type two error. If we fail to reject the null hypothesis when it is false, we've said now that there is no change when this ad was administered to our experiment group. So if we if we don't reject this, that there um, when it is actually false, that there is actually a difference, and uh, we are actually rejecting, um, we fail to reject this null hypothesis, then now uh, we have a type two error. Is that clear? Is that clear? Can I just have someone? Uh... Okay, Michael. So these errors, these two errors, we can actually avoid them in our test. Uh... Okay, Meron, I can uh, I can repeat that. So we have uh, two types of errors. We have the type one error, and uh, we have a type two error. Meron, if you noticed, both of these two errors are actually concerned uh, on the null hypothesis. 
So we've said that uh, a null hypothesis is very pessimistic pessimistic. We are trying to say that there is no change. The ones that we actually showed this ad, there is no change from the control group and the exposed group. That is what a null hypothesis states. So if we actually reject this null hypothesis and say that there is a change, when it is actually true that there is no change, then we've done a type one error. That is a false negative. Is that clear, Meron? Does that make sense? Okay, then type two error is now the opposite, the opposite of that. If uh, the null hypothesis is actually false, then we fail to reject that null hypothesis, then we will have a type two error, which is I think a uh, false positive. Yeah. So does that make it clear, Meron? Ah, okay. So as I was saying, these two errors we can avoid them from our test by calculating um, a statistical significance of our test. The main reason of actually doing any statistical test is uh, to get statistical significance. We can just do a normal comparison and say that uh, depending on the values, the number of people who did uh, control, maybe we can say uh, maybe there's a difference, maybe there's a change. But the reason for actually doing a hypothesis. Uh, testing and A-B testing is to get the statistical significance. So when you add the statistical significance to our test, we can actually reduce this error. Okay, so going into A-B testing, when uh, we say hypothesis testing, this is actually really broad, but uh, when we do A-B testing, most of the time there's only two products. We are doing either A or B. Maybe we are testing a site page and we are trying to see if uh, this kind of site is better than site B. For example, in our case, maybe we are trying to see if the users actually, uh, what's, what's the point? Uh, was it subscribe? Also, oh, we are trying to find uh, by using this smart ad, uh, do we have those ones now who are aware of this brand and those ones who are not aware? So we only have two options, yes and no. We are testing the ones who have been exposed to our smart ad and the ones who have not been exposed. So that is the main thing we have in A-B testing, comparing two types of things. Okay, so every time when we are doing an A-B test, we divide uh, our population into two. We have the control group and we have maybe now the treatment group or a exposed group or a the test group. So the main difference is, for example, like in our case, since we want to test whether the ad actually had an effect, the control group will just be shown the original ad while the treatment group will be shown now the ad, the smart ad. So that is how we separate our population. Uh, so, the other thing we'll be monitoring in A-B test is the conversion rate. From the control group who are shown just the normal ad, how many actually said yes, that they actually know this brand? And uh, from our exposed group, how many said that yes, they know this brand? So, we are trying to figure out if um, the ones who are shown the normal uh, ad what is the conversion rate? How many actually said yes that they know this brand? And after showing them another group, an exposed ad, how many of them know this brand? So this is uh, our target. Is that clear? Just to anyone confirm if that's clear? Okay, so the conversion rate will be calculated simply by uh, getting maybe the number of those people who said yes, we do know this brand, over the total number. So if we want the conversion rate for the control group, mm -hmm. we will do the number of yeses in the control group over the total, uh, total uh, sample size mm -hmm. for our control group. The same thing for the exposed group, that is how our conversion rate will be calculated. So something else that is key to actually note in A-B testing is uh, the 
randomness of the data. Mm -hmm. This is uh, very important because you'll find that in most cases, in a population of maybe 50,000 people, they won't do a test on all 50,000 people. We'll just pick a sample that will give us the best statistical significance. So from our population of 50,000, we will... Um, okay, I hope that is better. Okay, so from uh, maybe our population of 50,000, we will do just a small sample of maybe 4,000 people, 5,000 people. When we continue with the A-B test, we'll see how to determine the best sample for your test. Okay, so just a visual presentation of what I have just said uh, from uh, an entire group of population or a sample, we divide our group into two. We have the control group and uh, we have the exposed group, treatment group or the test group. So the first group, we just give them what is uh, already being used. In our case, that is just the dummy ad. Then the exposed group, we expose them to a smart ad. Then uh, finally, we say how many say that, yes, we do know this brand. So we can have maybe 17% from this group, maybe 25% from this group. So in the end, when you're actually working for a company, the point is now determining which one should we use. Should we just stick to our normal ad or uh, should we use the smart ad to increase brand awareness? So that is the point of our A-B test. And actually, A-B test is used in so many things. I was researching this morning and I noticed uh, you might find that maybe in uh, platforms like Netflix, they might use different thumbnails because maybe the click, the click rate of, a, of one thumbnail is higher than the other. So every time you click this kind of thumbnail, and they actually put that record. They are doing an A-B test to do recommender settings. So this is used mainly in marketing uh, marketing effort. Okay, so I'll go to principles of A-B testing, maybe just like a, a few things we need to follow to do an A-B test in the real world and in our challenge this week. So the first thing you do is you define the baseline conversion rate and the minimum detectable effect. So the baseline conversion rate, as I had said, we have conversion rates for both the control group and the exposed group. So the baseline conversion rate is the conversion rate for the control group. We will be using the conversion rate for the control group as uh, our baseline conversion rates. I uh, will be saying BCR from now on. And then the minimum detectable effect. This is now maybe if the if the control group um, uh, conversion rate maybe is 20% and your client, maybe your investor or your company has said that they will, they would just like to see a change of 2%. If they see a change of 2%, then the test is um, is successful. So this change of 2%, now this is the minimum detectable if, effect that we want to get from our from our test. I'll take you through a little bit later on how to calculate MDE in specific. Then we also need to calculate the sample side needed for a meaningful experiment. So as I had said earlier, okay, Rafa, I'll go through MD a little bit more later. Let me just introduce the B testing and the steps we need. I'll do a little bit um, detailed definition of this later on. So about sample size, like I'd say, they, you might find a population you are given uh, around 50,000. And in the real world, this is actually costly to do tests uh, for all these people. So most of the time we need that perfect sample size to conduct our, our experiment. Sorry. To conduct our experiment. So in A-B testing, there are a few things that can actually help you get that perfect sample size. We have the BCR helps in uh, doing uh, cal calculating the sample size. The MDE also helps. And then we have a significance level and a statistical power. So these two values, most of the time, they're just um, normal. You might find maybe a test requires just maybe an 80% significance level maybe a statistical power of uh, 0 0.05. This one are usually mainly constants, but I will look at it into that later. 
Then finally, you drive traffic to your variations until you reach the target sample for each variation. So for example, if you're doing this in maybe like the platform Netflix and you've decided that you want to do for 4,000 people, maybe each, you need 4,000 control group and you need a 4,000 um, exposed treatment group. So you just do traffic, you just share the ad, share the ad until you reach this sample size. And then finally, you evaluate, you evaluate the results of your A-B test. So from the data that we have, you'll find that most of these have already been defined because uh, we already have data that has already been uh, collected from a certain sample size. So what we'll be concentrating on this week mainly is just uh, doing the A-B test itself. That's for today. Most more for the week will be also on uh, machine learning. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so how do we determine our A-B test uh, is successful or not? If the difference in the performance between variations reached the MDE or exceeded, then the hypothesis is proven right. Otherwise, you start from scratch or uh, it just means that you failed uh, in your test. So we said that uh, MDE, just briefly before I go deeper into it, is the minimum change you'd like uh, to actually see in your ad to say that uh, it is successful. For example, we had a 20% conversion rate among our, um, our control group. So after exposing, if we actually have the conversion rate to 22% and we need, an, uh, we need just that 2% to be the minimum disturbable effect, then our test will be successful. But if it is anything lower than that, then uh, then our need is not successful and we'd have to do another test if you actually want to implement this this ad. So going deeper into, I think I've already mentioned uh, the BCR, there's nothing more to it. It's just the current conversion rate, so the control group. And then now the minimum detectable effect. Uh, Rafa, I hope you, this one will be a little bit clearer. It is uh, the minimum improvement over the conversion rate of the existing, let's say, ad. It is ad in our case. So just like I was saying, it is, uh, it is let me say in simple terms, the MDE is the sensitivity of our test. At what rate do we want to actually notice this change that our, maybe our new ad, Okay, Rafa, just speak up. I don't think I've understood that. Just speak up. Okay, hi, Nastasia. So it's just like, uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't get exactly um, how we decide um, this uh, percentage of, I mean. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm assuming in a, in a real world, maybe your investor will tell you, we need to see a 3% change. Okay. Maybe we need to see a 2% change. But in our case, we are not uh, in, direct, in direct conversation with, um, with the investor or the company. So the other thing, we can, you know, the MDE plus the BCR and the other variables, they help us to determine our perfect sample size. But in our case, we already have sample. From the data you are given, you, if you do just a quick edda, you'd notice that um, maybe the control group has maybe around 4,000 people and the exposed group has also maybe around 4,000 people. Since we already have, uh, we already have the sample size, uh, which was used for this uh, test, we actually have calculators that can help us now go back and get the MDE. You also notice from my next uh, point when I was trying to say oh. about the sample size. Oh, you, you did get that, Rafa, right? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, that's nice. So as I was saying how to calculate MDE, if, for example, you want to see just a change of 3%, how you calculate the MDE, you get now the desired lift that you'd want to see. Maybe that's 3% or uh, let me just use 2% what I have used in the calculation here. 
and then the baseline conversion rate here we had it at 20 uh, percent then you do uh, multiply by 100 so md is just uh, basically a percentage of uh, the baseline conversion rate so the lift that we desired maybe a two percent that will not be our md but if we do a percentage of the bcr now we will get our mde as uh, 10 10 percent is that clear and what this means is just now that a 10 percent relative effect is a two percent absolute change in the conversion rate is this clear is anyone confused there Okay, I'll take silence to assume that uh, everyone is at par with I am and has understood what MDE is. So the next thing that is uh, needed is the sample size, which the BCR helps to calculate. MD helps to calculate statistical power as well as uh, the significance level. So we've already gone through BCR and MDE. And uh, just to say something little about the statistical power, this is also the power of the hypothesis test and it is the probability that the text will correctly reject the null hypothesis so just to remind you the null hypothesis was the pessimistic hypothesis that there is no change <laughs> oh, salam salam i see your hand is raised just go ahead before i continue uh, yeah, I, I just want you to repeat uh, what you said on MD. I think uh, it's not clear uh, how it's 10%. Okay, so MDE, I've said uh, MDE, it is, uh, it is calculated as a percentage of the BCR. So if our... Um, if our investor or our client says that they want a 2% lift, they just want to see a 2% change in the conversion rate. That is now what we call the desired lift. Our MDE will be the desired lift, which is 2%, over the baseline conversion rate, which in our case is 20%. Then you do a percentage of that multiplied by 100. That's how we calculate the MDE. Okay. So, so yeah, two over twenty times a hundred gives ten. That's how MD is ten percent in this case. Okay. Okay. So, any other question before I continue to the sample needed sample size? How do I get BCR? So as I had said, the BCR is uh, it's just a normal conversion rate, but now the baseline conversion rate only focuses on the conversion rate for the control group. How do we get the baseline conversion rate? You just take maybe, for example, in our case, we, we asked this question, do you know the brand LUX? And we had two answers, yes or no. Where yes is the positive answer, they do know the brand and no is the negative answer. So from the exposed control group, maybe of 4,000 people, how many said yes? This is now the conversion rate that you want, how many said yes? So the number of people who said yes, divided by the total sample size for the control group, multiplied by 100. That's how we get the baseline conversion rate. Is that clear, Margaret? Okay. So going moving forward to the sample size needed, we have now mentioned BCR and MD. I hope uh, we all know that. Next, we go to the statistical power, and uh, we say that uh, this is the probability that the test correctly rejects the null hypothesis, where we say there is no change. So we actually reject this hypothesis and do say that the, actually there is a change. So this is the probability that uh, when we reject the null hypothesis, that we actually uh, correctly rejected it. So normally, I think this statistical power is uh, 
best put to 80% so that when we do our test, we would need a 80% uh, confidence that, um, yes, we've actually rejected the null hypothesis with that reason. Then, um, but uh, this, this statistical power is only useful when we are uh, actually rejecting the null hypothesis. Next, we have the significance level, and this is the boundary of specifying a statistical, uh, a statistically significant finding when interpreting the p-value. This is a little bit vague. Okay, so Meron, I see you are asking about the the p value. The p value is usually um, it's a value. Okay, just just a minute, Meron. I think I'll get back to you on that. I am not uh, direct on that answer. But Didia, when I said eighty percent for the statistical power. That is just like the recommender, the recommended one for tests. It could be 80% and higher. You might actually say maybe you need a 90 or 95% that is called power for your, for your test. So on the p-value, mm, I think I'll just throw that back to the group. I need someone who has done statistics a little bit more. Oh, Tades or Michael, can I just one of you speak up or let both of you speak up? Let's start with Tades. Tades, just explain to Meron and the entire group what the p-value is. Okay, Michael, I think Sadese has an issue with uh, his microphone. Michael, just speak up and explain to the group. Okay, both mics are not working. So Meron, just from the, from the chat. Ah, okay, that's nice. I think so maybe I'll do a little bit deeper on that and then I can also get back to you on Slack. Okay, so Didier, on calculating the statistical power, I think uh, it's not about calculating, it's just uh, when we say we have the percentages and uh, 80 to 90% is just like a generally global agreed nice percentage that is good for the test. It's not, it's not something that we actually calculate. You'd even find in most calculators that it has already been stated. You won't even need to actually state that. Okay, so here we have an example of a calculator that helps us uh, calculate the sample size. Okay, so you'll notice here that uh, from this, this is just one of the calculators we have online. You just input the baseline conversion rate. So we can just test it at uh, maybe we have 20%. This is in percentage, so let's do 20%. Then maybe we need an MDE of uh, 10%. Let's do the 10% that we were using in our, an MDE of 10%. 
So with the statistical significance here, we have uh, a 95. I can reduce this to 80. The statistical significance of 80, you see down here that we would need a sample size of 4,500. So for example, in our case, we already have this sample size. You after doing a EDA, maybe you notice both values range around 4,000 or 4,100 and not 4,500. And so since our baseline conversion rate does not change, you can maybe try to increase your statistical significance maybe to 90. Oh, that needs uh, more samples. So we can continue using, um, if you want maybe an 80% statistical significance, you can maybe, I think, Um, increase the MDE. You'll notice that uh, to 12, 3,000, we reduce it to 11, 3,600, about 10.5, 4,000. So in our case, you might find that uh, if you really have a sample size of 4,000, the better MDE to use would be 10.5. So in actually selecting an MDE, it is important to note that uh, the lower the MDE, the higher the sensitivity of your test. So it will be easier to actually note that change if you have a lower MDE. But then again, if you do an MDE of one, you notice that you would need a very huge sample size. If you just do an MDE of one, you'd need a sample size up to 730,000 and that can be really costly. So when you are uh, doing it in the environment, live environment, and uh, you're given a budget, the number of people you can attack, then uh, you can actually tame this MDE to give you just the perfect sample size that you need. So in our case, since we have maybe around 4,000, so maybe a 10.5 MDE would be perfect for our test. So, I see who some of these are questions. Jizayang is asking uh, what will be our measure if one variation fulfills this criteria and the other variation does not. Okay, so what I know what does not vary, the BCR will not vary, especially for this week. You can play with the statistical significance here to maybe let's do 95. We can do the significance of 95. See, the sample size is 4,800. So I think here we can, uh, is it reduce? No, no, we have to increase. We have to increase our MD. Nope, 12, nope, 11. Yeah, around, it's still 10.5. No. 10.7. Okay, you see that our MD does not vary a lot. So it just depends on the kind of statistical significance that you want. If you want to actually be 90, if you, can, uh, you know, when you do a statistical uh, report finding and uh, you are saying that uh, based on my results, I am 95% confident that. Uh, that uh, there will be a change or there would be no change. So since 80 to 25% is acceptable, you can just report it uh, maybe with 80 or 95 and then just vary the MDE. The BCR will not change that much. Is that clear design? Okay, so I think I'll uh, continue from there. I hope we now have a basic understanding of uh, A-B testing because next we'll be going into now how we do it exactly. Just There are just a few simple steps in doing, in doing an A-B test. So after we have our variables already set, what now we just try to understand. We do a distribution of the control group. We try to do a distribution of the exposed group and um, calculate the probabilities, we show the powers, we just find the areas, a lot of um, 
a lot of coding. But uh, in Python, this is made uh, simple because we have the the SciPy library SCP. The SciPy library. I hope. Uh, let me just type that in. We have the SciP dot stats library and that uh, will help us to do a lot of uh, plotting like the normal distribution binomial distribution so in our case since we have two answers we have yes and no we can just assume that uh, our data follows the Bernoulli type of um, variation and uh, that's why we will be doing a, a binomial. This is actually a binomial distribution. Let me show you the code. We'll be doing a binomial distribution. Okay, so I hope you can see. Okay, so the plot I've just shown you is just a normal distribution for the control group. And uh, you can see from this library, as I was telling you, the SciP.stat library, we can just directly do a binomial plot and uh, give it the sample size and uh, the conversion rate. And uh, we from this distribution i also plotted i just wanted to know from uh, our exposed group how does it uh, relate to our control group and uh, that's why i will draw we actually draw this line sorry that's why we draw this blue line we draw this blue line Oof. That's why we draw this blue line and you can see it is completely out of the range of our control group. And uh, we can just say that they are, they are not, they do not relate as much just from the way we can see from this. This is just a sample plot. If you do for the suite, you might actually find that maybe they actually relate. So the next thing about, since this is just a probability does not show us how they relate, the next thing we can do is plot both the control group distribution and uh, the exposed group distribution and that's what we have uh, here next so from what you can see this red one is what we had at the beginning this is our control group and the blue one is our exposed group so just to understand the plot a little bit you'd notice that uh, from the width from the width of these distributions you'd notice that our exposed group actually reached a lot more people than uh, our control group did but uh, you notice again that the peak, the peak of the exposed group is slightly lower than um, the peak for the control group. I think um, this would be would have something to do with the conversion rates being a little bit lower in the exposed group. Okay, so this is just the, what you've just gone through. This is just a general understanding of uh, just the distribution of our, our groups. If you want to now do the statistical uh, significance and actually find the, stat the statistical data, we'll do another plot to plot now the null and the alternate hypothesis for the test and define the statistical power and significance. So the plot for this is actually a little bit detailed and like uh, what you've just gone through. Oh, this is plot. I think this is it. So you go into detailed and uh, you're using so many things. You're using the standard deviation. We are, we are showing the area, the power area. We are showing the alphas. We are showing the beta. The alpha is, uh, I think the alpha is the statistical significance and then the beta is the i don't know not the beta the beta should be oh 
the probability that we actually accept the null hypothesis and reject the alternate hypothesis. So from just uh, from this code, it's oh sorry, sorry about that. From this code, I, I think I'll share this, just a sample of this. From this code, uh, we can now, we get this kind of plots. And uh, you know the red, the red distribution is uh, the null hypothesis, and uh, the blue distribution. My screen is not shared. Oh, sorry about that, guys. I think my laptop just uh, disconnected from the meeting. So you can see my screen now. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, so our null and our alternate distributions would look like this from the code i think i'll share the code later you know we just have to explain a little bit more we have the null hypothesis in uh in the red distribution the alternate hypothesis uh in the blue distribution then we have the power indicated here the statistical power we also have uh, our alpha which is now the statistical significance and uh, our beta this should be the probability that we reject the Null, no, we accept the null hypothesis. Okay, so when we'll be doing this kind of uh, distribution, you notice maybe the green, the green area. This uh, this area shows. Um, uh, let me just confirm this area shows. Oof. Okay, so the green shaded area, it represents the statistical power, which as we have just seen is 0 0.556. And uh, we also have this, um, let me just go back to the slideshow. Okay, so the value here is 0 0.556. This is our statistical power, and it is uh, represented by this uh, green shaded area. It is the area that is under the alternate hypothesis, but uh, outside our confidence interval. Our confidence interval is uh, indicated by the gray dotted lines. I hope you can see them. Then we have the red shaded area. This is, uh, this is what represents our beta which is now the percentage that we actually accept. Is it accept or reject the null hypothesis? Just a minute. Mm. That we accept. We accept the null hypothesis. Yeah, I accept. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Michael, that we actually accept the null hypothesis and reject the alternate hypothesis. Then the area that falls under the null hypothesis, uh, but uh, outside the confidence interval, this is now our statistical significance. You can see here it is just 0.025%. So I think this is acceptable. But the fact now that we have our power here as 0 0.556, which is 55.6%, this would uh, say that our ad campaign did not did not give us the the percentage that we actually hoped because we're actually targeting for this power to be above 80 percent and such an analysis would uh, make us now go back to the drawing board maybe increase the sample size and change tweak things a little bit better so so that we accept uh, so that we actually say that there was a difference, we reject our null hypothesis. This power has to be 80% or above. So is that clear? From there, I think uh, 
there is no more. We we'll just end our class. That is all about uh, A-B testing. If there are any questions, I think uh, we can take it uh, now. Any questions on A-B testing? There are two other methods of hypothesis testing that we'll go through in the course of the week. A-B testing is just one of them. Tomorrow morning, uh, we'll go through the sequential sequential testing. And then in the afternoon, we'll do the machine learning um, models. Uh, but uh, for now, that was just the A-B testing. If there are any questions, you can just raise now before we close the class. <laughs> Okay, I'm the, the slide. The slide I've just shared is not in the week too, but I will add it along with a few codes, a few codes. But um, can you elaborate about the significance percentage? You're talking about the 95% or which significance are you talking about, Michael? Sure. Okay, the 95%. This is just uh, the confidence that we can say that um, that we are actually rejecting this null hypothesis with a 95% confidence. So when you're actually representing your data, especially statistical data, you have to say uh, if you actually are agreeing with this null hypothesis or disagreeing, in what percentage are you sure with your results? So just saying an 85% significance, is uh, that is the significance of your test. You can put it to as low as 80, but not lower than that, and you can go to as high as 95%. The last slide graph, okay. Okay, so actually my call, I have lost, uh, my laptop has lost some in the Wi-Fi connection. I might be unable to share it now, but I, I think I'll just share it in the week two folder. My laptop has lost connection to internet. <clears throat> Is that okay, Michael? Okay, sure. So any other question before we end the class? Any other concern? What do you mean by more? Michael, what uh, should we submit one report to? Okay, I'm actually not uh, the about the group work. I think uh, that we'll just have to get back to you on Slack. I don't want to give wrong information about the report. I've seen this question a lot. And uh, apologies for not getting back to you guys sooner, but I will confirm this and uh, tell you about how many repositories will will be needed. But we'll get back to you over Slack. Okay. If the task actually tells you to create another repo, unless it is communicated otherwise, just go on ahead and create another repo if the task says so. If the task says so, just do so, but uh, if uh, there will be more communication on that, we will get back to you over Slack. Is that clear, Michael? 
Okay, cool. Okay, so I'll just assume that there is no other question. If there's another question, you can just ask now before I end another one minute. Any concern, any question on A B testing? Okay, so I uh, assume that all is well. Thank you guys for attending the tutorial session. Um, uh, nice time as you do your work for today and uh, we'll meet tomorrow for another session. Bye guys.